Welcome to another edition of Diaspora News in Brief. This week, we look at the community and how the acting stage can be used as a platform to spread a message. There are a lot of issues that are going on around the world. So I just want to put my name and my face on films that make the changes in other people's lives. We were the great uh, merchant business people. Forget about Bill Gates and all this. They're nobody. It's very important to write a will. Tomorrow is promised to no one. The mainstream would have you believe that Africans have achieved nothing, but we caught up with two authors who tell us the truth. Most people have this idea that before slavery, it's all unknown prehistory in the African jungles. You then find out that Africa wasn't really jungle. There were cities, there were nations, there were empires. So what we're doing then is we're bringing a sense of history to black people. You see this thing here? And let me show you, you've got that there. That monument, mm -hmm. that was originally built in the 11th century, still standing in a modern West African city called Jene. There it is. Mm. And that says that, wait a minute, we were building stuff. What about all the mud huts we've been told? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the whole thing then is to challenge the stereotypes mm -hmm. about us, our ancestors, and where we fit into world history. Seeing stuff like this, challenges one's thinking process. And you, 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 you tend to think, should I believe this or not? My orientation is different. My orientation is thus. But they're now presenting this to me. What has your response been from people within our community about this book? People who have seen it love it. Let me explain how that came about. You see, um, we're aware of the resistance that you're talking about. So we wrote the book to challenge it head on. So in putting this together, we've researched what do the geographers say? What do the architects say? You know I mentioned that building there? Mm -hmm. What do architects say about it? They say it's the largest clay brick building in the world. So that ain't me saying that. Mm -hmm. Go and take it up with Jean-Louis Bourgeois. He was the one that said it. Um, in every case, we're talking about every aspect of life, buildings, school, university. You know I mentioned Timbuktu? Mm -hmm. um, according to National Geographic, um, there were 25,000 students um, at the University of Timbuktu in the 16th century. Now, people want to argue, don't argue with me, argue with National Geographic. In fact, anyone watching this right now can Google National Geographic and, and in capital letters, mm -hmm. Timbuktu, and just watch the articles just come up including the 700,000 manuscripts that we talked about earlier. Now, Saren, you've been involved in this project with Robin. Um, what are your insights? What, what really inspired you to join this project? Oh, what really inspired me is the passion of Robin, first of all, and my own passion, because I was born and grown up in Africa, West Africa, and I am a descendant of the people of Timbuktu. Mm. And I hate lies. In the book, there's a part that deals with economy. Mm -hmm. We were the great uh, merchant business people in West Africa. So Timbuktu, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Not just Timbuktu, Jene, uh, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria. We were the great Ashanti people. We were mm -hmm. the great, forget about Bill Gates and all this. I, <laughs> I mean, they're nobody. Since I know my history, if we've, we've done that in the past, we can still do it today. Absolutely. All right, just to pick up on this thing about Bill Gates, mm. right? um, one of the things that came out um, in the news October last year was a whole series of articles that was in the national press. Right? And one of those articles was The Independent, 16th of October 2012. And The Independent said, meet Mansa Musa I of Mali, the richest human being in all history. Right? Um, the Daily Express had revealed the richest person ever, and the number one was Mansa Musa I, with an estimated, if you were to translate the 14th century money into modern money, £249 billion. Pounds, right? The Daily Mail, 15th of October, had meet the 14th century African king who was the richest man in the world of all time adjusted for inflation. So I think that puts Bill Gates into a context. <laughs>
We know Africans and Caribbeans hate the idea of writing a will. One business owner tells us the dire consequences of failing to do so. The whole idea around wills is something that scares most people, yes. particularly people under the age of 40. What would you say to people who are either traditionally or contemporarily afraid of putting a will together? Um, the first thing I would ask them is, if they, if, do they drive? Because the likelihood is, if they drive, they've got car insurance and they've also got a breakdown or roadside assistance. Mm -hmm. So they've planned for that eventuality of their car maybe not, or dying, their car dying on them, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so if they've made the plan for that and they're driving in their car and they, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see, you know, what happens if you're in a car crash or anything like that. I mean, tomorrow is promised to no one, mm -hmm. okay? We're here now, but God knows what's going to be held for us tomorrow, yeah. you know? So where we have children in particular, um, it's very important to write a will. And a will can be as cheap as 50 pounds, okay? But it's important that you get a will done properly, by the way. But you can get a will done very cheaply. You can even do it yourself. As long as you state, this is who the guardian for my children would be, then your children are not gonna end up in care, okay? okay? Likewise, if you have assets, you want to be able to state, this is who I want those assets to go to. Whether they will receive those assets is another thing because they would need the trusts mm -hmm. to make sure that those assets are protected. Um, but if you've not written a will, um, I mean, it, it really is something I, I can't stress enough. It is fundamental that you write a will um, only because if you don't, you die in test date. That's where the government make all of decisions about everything relating to you and your life, your children, your assets. So, no, you definitely don't want to put yourself in that position. Do you think our community are particularly at risk in terms of how it is we look after our pensions and securing whatever wealth that we've got? Very much so. Um, and I think it's because of a lack of awareness. Um, I think once the awareness is there, then we do take action. But it's, it's due to that lack of awareness and not understanding what the implications are. Pensions have been underperforming for a long time. And naturally, that does cause a problem for people planning their retirement and hoping to have a comfortable retirement. But then on top of that, um, the government are acting in the way that they're acting. For example, quantitative easing, where they're now printing money. Yes. That has an impact on government guilt, which later on has an impact on how pensions pay in the future. Um, and then when you take pensions as a problem for those who were born um, in the 60s and 70s, when you then think about their parents who may be leaving an estate for them um, via property or, or other assets they, they may have, you've got inheritance tax, which is 40% of the person's estate if it's over um, the zero band allowance. So that's anything over 325,000 if you're single. And, and if you're married, it's anything over 650,000. So the inheritance tax is a problem. Then on top of that, you've got the local authority now putting a comfort charge. It's not even now, they've been doing it for a long time. If the person requires care in old age, then the local authority will look to recoup that cost from their estate, from, um, you know, from the, the fees that they've incurred. So where you're looking at residential care fees being anywhere between a thousand to two thousand pounds per week okay sixty to seventy thousand pounds per year it doesn't take long for somebody to have spent a few years in care in old age mm -hmm. and everything they've worked hard for has just gone just gone, gone to the sure. government yeah. exactly yeah. so the um, institute for fiscal studies really did highlight the problems that people born in the um, 70s and those born in the 60s are going to be facing in retirement okay and that's why as an organization our um, primary focus is to help address both of those problems many of us have no idea of the impact film has on changing communities we caught up with one of nollywood's star actresses who uses her status to bring about change I started um, acting with the Young Vic here. When I came mm. from Africa in 1995, um, I went straight to college and I started I studied performing art and then I went to Rayhampton Institute where I got a degree in um, acting. Mm. But I didn't go straight into acting. Okay. You know, I took time out and then came back. I started theatre acting. I did the Arabian Nights at the Young Vic for about a year. 
and then I put a stop to it too and uh, went into a lot of charitable work mm. and um, around the process got married first time yes. Yes. to a footballer so the life changes and they become a fascinating <laughs> life and acting wasn't part of that but then mm. when my marriage break with my ex I decided to go back to the career that I actually wanted to be which is acting mm. so um, the first person that approached me was Obi Emelonye, which is um, the guy who did Mirror Boy. Right. And these are the people involved in OHTV, I believe? Um, OHTV, basically, they financed Mirror Boy, but Obi yeah. Emelonye was the one who wrote the story and directed the film. So OHTV were basically the money people. Mm. They invested the money into the film, but Obi Emelonye wrote the film and directed the film. Right. So what are you working on at the moment? Um, I've just finished... I have a film coming out on the 26th of April, it's called The Soul. And then I just, come, I just came back from Africa, I was doing a film called Sarata, which is um, about um, cervical cancer. Mm. So um, that at the moment is very close to my heart. And you know, um, I produced my own film called Battered, which is about domestic violence. So what I've done with my career now is that I've changed I, I'm very selective with the kind of film I, I put my face or my name on now because mm -hmm. I don't just want to do random films. I don't just want to do films for the sake of filmmaking. I want films that have messages, films that will help other people. There are a lot of issues that are going on around the world. I'm, I'm starting a film, well, I'm starting shooting another film tomorrow, um, which is about this female genital circumcision yes, thing, which is now... Is. Yes. Basically the big deal. So I just want to put my name and my face on films that makes the changes in other people's life. Okay. Now you, you mentioned that you did a production called Battered. Mm -hmm. um, how is that, how, how did that come about? Was that because of your experience doing charitable work or things that you might have read or seen? I met, I, I have three friends um, that actually unfortunately live here in the UK and um, they've gone through a lot of domestic violence but because of this African Thing. I don't want people to know my business. I don't want people to know what is going on in my life. But they talk to me. Mm -hmm. So I felt if there is a way I can help these women is to actually, I'm not a police officer, I'm not a social worker, but I can write a story around it. Let these women actually watch me play them mm -hmm. and then decide whether they want to stay in that um, kind of environment, which was good for me. Um, the film has won me African Best Actress. The film, I'm, I'm going to Nigeria in two weeks' time because the film is nominated also for the best story, which means their story is making the wave. That's right. So people are listening. So acting is really, for you, a vehicle to get a message across? For me, that is my purpose, really. It's not about the money or the fame because there's a lot of other ways. I mean, I've been on TV since I was like 15. But for me, acting is about passing on a message to people and tell them, you can change this. I'm not a government official. I don't sign documents to change things and bring, change constitution for people. But then mm -hmm. you can watch my film and maybe by seeing what I'm trying to tell you, you know somebody who's going through that problem and you can help them. So what advice would you give young women who see you as being a role model, but they may not have the skills or the talent to get into the industry. <laughs> I keep saying, people come into this industry saying, I want to be famous. Fame is not the reason why you want to be an actress or an actor or anything in this life. Because fa how long are you going to be famous for? Mm. You have to know what you want. Don't just come into this industry because this industry can eat you up. If, you don't, if you're not strong enough mentally, Physically, a lot of people will try to abuse their position just because they know you're desperate to be there. Mm. You have to be very focused and very smart and know what you want. And when you feel you can't do this thing for anyone, tell them, no, I'm not doing it. Because there is no fame that wants to take a woman's pride. So what can we see Fatima Jab doing in the next five years? I'm going to be the first lady of Sierra Leone. The first lady of Sierra Leone? Yes. Yes, well, you might want to tell us about what has <laughs> happened recently. Because <laughs> I know you're not joking about that. No, I'm not. Um, yes. 
Well, um, I, I got married again, luckily for me. <laughs> um, I'm married to a former president who is um, the president of Sierra Leone, but as a mm. military guy. And um, we're going back now as um, a democratically elected flag bearer to contest for the presidency in Sierra Leone, which will happen in 2017. That's very interesting. And it also sounds quite dangerous as well. But does that for you provide you with an, a, another avenue to become what it is that you've been working at all the time? Being a first lady, if I, if I had the opportunity to be the first lady of um, Sierra Leone, will just give me the platform that I wanted to talk to the world and then I'll let the world listen to me. Um, there's a lot of things I believe first ladies can do to change the way women suffer, mm -hmm. especially in Africa, but they don't do that. They focus on their makeups and their handbags and their shoes. I want to be that woman that will speak up for the women of Africa. This has been Carb Direct Diaspora News in Brief. Join us next time for more news, commentaries, and exciting interviews to keep you informed.